Okay, open up your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians 5. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going through our beginner's discipleship or our basic doctrines, but like I always like to say, it's not really that basic. It's good stuff that we need to be reminded, and also some of the things that we've forgotten that we need to see, and also some new things in the original basics that we saw before. That usually happens when you study the Word of God. Amen. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. Today we'll be talking about heaven. Heaven, it's a doctrine that is taken from angelolo uh, angelology, okay? The meaning of angelology is the study on angels, a theology on angels. And this is their home, angelic beings. This is the home of celestial angelic beings, such as God, who is represented as the angel of the Lord, for the remaining sons of God, cherubim, seraphims, and us who will have resurrected body like the angels. Amen. So we're going to be studying about heaven. Let's first talk about the origin of heaven. The origin of heaven. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So it was created in the beginning. Long before the creation of mankind, long before the creation of the six days with earth, the heavens, uh, me and you, etc., now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, the origin of heaven is that it was created in the beginning, but it is permanent, it will last forever. It never dies out. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Hence, we see right here that once heaven was created in the beginning, that it lasts for eternity makes one wonder what was before the beginning when heaven was created. Just God. So it is natural to assume that in the beginning when God created heaven, and if heaven is a home for angels, that's when those sons of God and angels, Lucifer and etc., were created before they fell. So it was probably during that time, or excuse me, very likely during that time, when all those beings were created. John chapter 14, John chapter 14, and we'll look at verse 2. Regarding the origin of heaven, it is a prepared place for prepared people. Are you prepared for heaven? If not, then it's not for you. If you're prepared, then praise the Lord, you got a place after you die. You don't have to worry about where you will go like many billions who don't know. John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So it's already been prepared for us. Now go to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Your, I want you to also write down, but not turn there, Write down, but don't turn there, because we already turned there, 2 Corinthians 5.1. 2 Corinthians 5.1. You'll notice right uh, in this passage, 2 Corinthians 5.1, that it's not man-made. It's God-made. God prepared it. We have an earthly, uh, we have a tabernacle prepared, built in the heavens, it said. So it's God-made, it's not man-made. And when you look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Another thing to note, obviously God lives there. When God created it in the beginning, he also lives there. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. So God lives there. Another thing to note about heaven, if you will write down 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 again, the third time, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, heaven has buildings. It's not just clouds. 
That's a mistake a lot of people make. They think that heaven is just a bunch of poofy clouds where there's chubby angels uh, playing with their harps. That's not true. It has buildings. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, if you wrote that down, you'll notice that it's a building prepared by God. Building prepared by God. Now, the names of heaven. Names of heaven. We're not going to turn to all these verses. You're going to spend time writing them down, actually, because we don't have time, and there's so many different names of heaven. If you notice these words or phrases in the Bible, then keep in mind in the future that, oh, it's talking about heaven. So you want to know that. So the first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. The most common one is the third heaven. The most common one is the third heaven. So that's the one name of heaven. The next one, write down Matthew 3, 12. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12. Another name for heaven that you'll notice from the word of God is that it is known as the bar. Okay, the garner, excuse me, the garner. It is known as the garner. Another one to note from the Word of God is Ephesians 5.5. 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. Third name for heaven is kingdom of Christ and of God. Kingdom of Christ and of God. Another name for heaven is John chapter 14 verse 2. John chapter 14 verse 2 known as the Father's house. The Father's house. Amen. That's good. Another name for heaven is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. Rest. It's also known as rest. Place of rest. Another one is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Another name for heaven is paradise. Paradise. All right, you'll notice that these five names of heaven are given out from the Word of God. Now you know. All right, don't get confused in the future. And if you're going to look up these terms, don't think, well, what's that mean? Well, it means heaven. It's that simple. Now we're going to talk about the size of heaven. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, make sure that I'm not cut or out of bounds. So I know that we weren't able to do that before. So Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's now talk about the size of heaven. We talked about the origin of heaven. We talked about the names of heaven. Now we're going to talk about the size of heaven. It's immeasurable. It's immeasurable. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, and we'll look at verse 37. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all of the seed of Israel, etc. Meaning that it, heaven is immeasurable. God is challenging people to measure heaven meaning that it is immeasurable. Now go to Revelation 21, Revelation chapter 21. Now you'll notice compared to advanced discipleship, beginner's discipleship, I give you way more scripture. Amen. So it's not a simple Bible study like some people might think. You do have to write down a lot of scripture. If people ask you in the future, give me a verse where heaven is immeasurable, do you know chapter and verse? That's why you need to write it down. If they ask you, what, give me some names of heaven. Can you name them from the top of your head with chapter and verse? So that's why this beginner's discipleship is important. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 2, New Jerusalem. Now, this is something that comes out of heaven. Heaven is immeasurable. New Jerusalem is a heavenly place that comes out of heaven, and it can be measured. Let's look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. 
So notice something comes out of heaven. It's New Jerusalem. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard, uh, excuse me, that's where it ends. If you look at verse 16, we get the measurement. Verse 16. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Supposedly, it is 1,200 miles. Length, width, and height. Length, width, and height. Supposedly, 1,200. 200 miles length, 1,200 miles wide, 1,200 miles high. According to Dr. Rutman, he sees it as a double pyramid. He estimates, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, and these might be old statistics since this is from uh, the older times, 100 million dying each year, if that were to happen, the size can fit from the, the time period of Acts 2 when the church started all the way till now. So if 100 million were to die every year from Acts 2 till, I guess, maybe when Dr. Rutland gave that estimate, 1980s, 1990s, everybody should be able to have 10 rooms, 10 feet square out of solid gold. So it should be enough room. Now, you'll notice right there that heaven is definitely big enough. Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah chapter 57. Let's talk about what heaven is like. What heaven is like. Well, heaven is very, very high. It's a high place, away from the wickedness of this world, away from the sorrows of life. You notice how business executives, rich people, they always want to live on top of things, live very high get a beautiful view of many things. But heaven, you'll get the highest view of all, the highest point of all. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Notice right here, God lives in a high place. And remember, where does God live? In heaven. We saw that earlier. So we do know heaven is a high place. Go to Psalm chapter 20. Psalm chapter 20 and verse 6. Heaven is holy without sin. It is a holy place without sin. Imagine a place where you'll never sin against God. No wicked temptation in front of your eyes. The places that you go to try to sin, there's no sin. Sorry. Amen. Ain't that a wonderful place? That's right. A place where you're not exposed to hearing sin or tasting sin. Amen. Psalm chapter 20 and verse 6. The Bible says, Now I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his what? Holy, holy heaven. It's holy without sin. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Heaven is a place without night or darkness. It has no night. It has no darkness. Go to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3 through 5. Verse 3 through 5. A lot of people do not like the dark, and if people say they do like nighttime, well, the only reason why you like nighttime is because you see the pretty city lights and you see the stars in the sky. If it was completely pitch black, you wouldn't like it. And the evidence is, would you blind your both eyes? Nobody does. So nobody likes the dark. In heaven, all sorts of lights. That's why it's going to be beautiful. That's the only reason why you would like the city lights at night. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 through 5, the Bible says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Okay, this is the place where God lives then. Then in verse 5, And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7. There's no more starvation, famine, and excessive heat and sun rays, all gone. None of that. 
So what you're suffering on this earth, people trying to solve world hunger, they will never solve it. You need God to solve it. When we go out street preaching and visitation and people talk about a heat wave coming, praise the Lord, none of that. None of that when we go to heaven. Revelation chapter 7, verse 16, they shall hunger no more, no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, you don't have to turn there because we read it, but write down Revelation 22, verse 3. The verse says, there shall be no more curse. So the curse of sin is gone. The curse of sin is gone. Think about everything, every unfairness that you're going through in this current life. Wh who do we blame? Not God. It's the curse of sin. Well, once that's gone, do you know how much percentage of your problem is gone? <laughs> Pretty much 90%, right? If not 99. Psalm 30, verse 8. Psalm chapter 30, verse 8. Satisfaction and pleasure. Satisfaction and pleasure. How many people make fun of Christianity and they prefer to live a life full of drugs or pleasure and satisfaction when they're just wasting their whole life away? One, that's temporary and they have to seek after that. Two, when they die, they burn in hell for all eternity. For us, in our end, we have it for all eternity. That's feeling, that pleasure, that satisfaction. It's for all eternity. Psalm chapter 30 and verse 8. The Bible says... I cry to thee, O Lord, and unto uh, the Lord I made supplication. Now, I think that's the wrong... Uh, ah, I see. I see what I did. Compare that with Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Keep your hand here and go to Psalm 65. And we'll look at verse 1, Psalm 65, and we'll read verse 1. The Bible says, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Sion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquity shall prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Amen. Now, we know that the reference here, it is uh, in context of the nation of Israel when they uh, go through the millennial kingdom with God. As they go through the millennial kingdom with God, they receive satisfaction. Now, the question is, well, if that's what happens in the millennium, this has nothing to do with heaven, right? Well, no, that's incorrect, because if this is done on God's kingdom on earth, the millennium for the nation of Israel, how much more so with heaven, which is far more perfect, which is God's home, which has uh, eternity of ten times the pleasure and satisfaction, I'm sure. So taking all these into account, we do know that heaven is a place of satisfaction and pleasure where there is no more pain, there is no more sin, and that feeling that everybody is trying to seek after, but they'll never get it. They try to find it in drugs, they try to find it in sex, they try to find it in socializing, they try to find it in food, but none of that pleasure can ever be felt compared to heaven for eternity. We look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 21 and then verse 4. This is a true list of pure bliss and happiness. You don't even have to turn to any other verse. This is the most famous passage that will describe anything that you want about bliss and heaven. Right. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. The Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible has a lot to say about heaven. You notice that? Yeah. 
You notice how the Bible gives a lot of descriptions about heaven? People think that heaven is boring. They don't know their Bible, do they? They really don't know their Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 3. The Bible says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? We will rule over all angelic beings. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. People are into spells because they want to control certain spirits. They're into, I mean, it's so outdated now. They're into like Yu-Gi-Oh! and uh, Harry Potter and all that kind of garbage because they want to be in control of certain guardians or spirits and well, all those things are are sons of God. Those are celestial creatures, angelic beings. You will rule over those things. How do you get it? You don't need to give blood or do, do some kind of rituals or vow, vows or performance or do some lucky charms or chants. You just receive it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Imagine that, huh? Imagine that. All right, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? These are angelic creatures who will minister and serve us. You're part of the same bunch, aren't you? How about the heirs of salvation? Uh, look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. If that ain't enough, you have rulership over nations. Rulership over nations. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Do you know how many uh, billionaires want to become, or rich, famous people want to become presidents? They're not content with their riches. They want power. They want to rule over countries and people. Well, in spite of how much money they have, or even if you're a president, you're only a ruler of one nation, see? A believer in Christ is ruler over nations, plural. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, And hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Look at 22, chapter 22, chapter 22. Man, ain't that something? And then people are all into the elections, the race, and people are willing to risk their lives too, get assassinated just to what? Get more power, get more control? Uh, you don't have to worry about that. If someone shot you and assassinated you, you're in a quicker ticket to rule over nations, actually. You don't have to live through that or protect yourself. But once you're shot, that's it, right? You can't rule over a nation. Sorry, it's gone. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall, notice right here, reign forever and ever. You have rulership. Now we're going to look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Okay, we've learned about what heaven is like. We've learned about what heaven is like. But now we want to learn what heaven looks like. What heaven looks like. So let's look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 19 through 20. It is ornamented with all kinds of jewels. So it is built in with minerals, diamonds, gold, silver. I mean, it's just something, all kinds of jewels. It's built in. You notice how people make their buildings with uh, granite, marble, and then we're all like stupid human beings. Wow, this is marvelous. Imagine if it's built in with the minerals, the precious stones. How much more will it blow away your mind? Uh, look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 19. The Bible reads, In the foundations of the wall of the city. Now, this is the basement of heaven. This is the basement. It's not built out of, uh, you know, cement or mortar, okay? And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation, oh, the first basement level was jasper, the second level of the basement, sapphire, the third, a chalcedony. My goodness, this is quite a place. The fourth, an emerald, the fifth, blah, blah, blah. You go on and on all the way 
to verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. So every several gate was of one pearl. Now, I don't know how that looks, but man, that must be something. To have several gates consisted of one pearl. Can you picture that? I don't know how it's going to look like, but I guarantee you it's going to be pretty awesome. Amen. Have some architect uh, build that, huh? They're not, they won't know what that means. They won't know how to build that. What a beautiful place. Uh, when we write down Revelation 21, 21, that's another passage, and that's the 12 gates of pearl. The 12 gates of pearl. You wonder why God chose pearl. Might be, when we actually see it, then we'll know why. We'll go, you know, that's the perfect uh, stone that the Lord selected. Amen. We look at John chapter 14, verse 2. You don't have to turn there, but write it down, John 14, 2. We know that verse, and that verse, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. So if you look at different modern Bible translations, they'll say rooms. And praise the Lord that our Father's house is not rooms. It's mansions. So it's built in with so many mansions that you can hardly imagine. Amen. You can hardly imagine. It's a beautiful place. It's built in New Jerusalem with mansions. Revelation 22.1 Revelation 22.1, it's a crystal river. It's a crystal river. You seen the Bay Area? I mean, you go, man, that's pretty, and then you just uh, keep looking through it, and then it's just mingled with green moss and yeah. dirty stuff later on. If you're that, <laughs> if that's how much you marvel about the Bay Area, you ain't seen nothing yet. Imagine Whoa. crystal river. Yeah. All right, th that solved the litter for you what all the environmentalists are shooting for. I mean, it's accomplished simply by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. So why don't you humble yourself, environmentalist, you liberal, and then just receive Christ by faith. Instead of taking so much pride in your man-made effort and cleaning up our planet, and you notice right here we still got garbage in our streets. All right, you go to Revelation 22.1, and he showed me a pure river. I think the Lord deliberately put that there. Not like Bill Gates taking sewage water and you drinking water out of it. Poop water, you know. Come on. This is what we're all aiming for one day. We're going to be aiming one day, mark my words, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I have a feeling we're going to be all drinking sewage water if Jesus keeps on tearing. Pretty soon we're going to be drinking all that. I mean, you heard about California, about the restrictions on the water that is starting to pass. And, I mean, if you're going to get over there, we're in serious trouble then. We're in serious trouble. Our next generations, we don't know what kind of water they'll be drinking by the time we turn older. Pray for that rapture to hit. Pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Makes me wonder why God says that. Maybe it means during the tribulation it's impure water. Makes me wonder. Maybe it means that they, he, God knows that the water is going to be filthy during that time. Pretty soon it'll turn into blood. It's undrinkable. Go to Revelation 21.21. 21. Streets of pure gold. Streets of pure gold. <laughs> I mean, asphalt? Come on. And you notice in Phoenix, Arizona, that the, that the specific elements they chose for the pavement on the streets is not helping. So then they have to put some kind of special pavement so that the heat doesn't burn them all up. In our place, we get streets of pure gold. Amen. Revelation 21, 21. Notice right here, the Bible says, the middle of verse 21, and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass. It's see-through. You can see yourself through it. That's how beautiful the street is. Revelation 22.2. Revelation 22.2. And there's a tree of life that bears 12 kinds of fruits, and it does healing as well. Uh, imagine that God's creation is so beautiful that even in this corrupted earth we live in, if you were to eat its fruit, it does give you health benefits. 
It's beautiful. It's, it's so amazing. But when, it's, when the fruit has its genuine purity, do you know how much it really heals you? <laughs> Man, that's something. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 2. The Bible says, In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Amen. You, know, you know these people, they're into magic trees. You notice that? <laughs> they put portraits and walls of magic trees. And they try to design, uh, me and the missus, we went to, I forgot the place, but it was very beautiful. They, they set up the lights all over the hills and I think even the trees too. So then when it was nighttime and the lights shone, you thought you were in magic land. It was just so beautiful. And I was like, man, I mean, it just, imagine the tree of life. Imagine the streets of pure gold. This is, it's beyond that. And you'll notice that the tree keeps on changing every month, right? Amen. <laughs> every month it's a different tree. Man, it's a wild tree. It's something. Amen. It's something. All right, Revelation 4, verse 3. Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. In this earth we live in, you have to go through a heavy storm. You have to go through rain and cloudy days to get your perfect rainbow, but not in God's place. No storms of life you have to go through. No rain, no cloudy days you have to go through. You get that rainbow, and not just a normal rainbow, a perfect rainbow. Revelation 4, verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon me like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Ain't that something? So the rainbow is like unto emerald. That's another thing about heaven. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I can guarantee it's going to look really good. Now we're going to cover the bodies in heaven. The bodies in heaven. Go to Romans chapter 7. Go to Romans chapter 7. If there is any uh, artist or uh, graphic arts designer there, I want, them, I want them to spend their time on creating heaven by looking at every verse in the Bible. Like literally try to apply some of those things in the Bible. Twelve gates, one pearl. Rainbow like unto emerald. I mean, just select those colors and create those designs and then maybe they could see a glimpse of heaven itself. I don't know. So if they could design something like that, maybe we can get a little closer picture of heaven. I don't know. But anyway, it's just food for thought, something for people to think about. But Romans chapter 7, verse 23. Now let's talk about what kind of bodies we will have in heaven. Let's talk about what kind of bodies that we will have in heaven. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 23, the Bible says, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, our current body, we can all agree that it is not a good body. We hate this body because we're always conflicted, uh, struggling with sin, struggling with our weaknesses, not even just sinful struggles, but just our own personal deficits, our weaknesses that we're ashamed about. And we're going to be delivered from all that. Chapter 8, verse 18. Chapter 8 and verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Yes, this current body we're living in that we struggle with back and forth. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? We're waiting for our transformation to become like the angels, sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Amen. 
Man, deliverance from the lust of sin, we will never want to sin again. Amen. Imagine a body like that. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. You know what the closest to that was? It was your body when you were in innocence. Come on, don't tell me that you were into contemporary music. No, when you were in innocence, when you were a baby, you want that noise shut off. It sounded godless. It sounded like it grieved your spirit. It gave you no peace. That's the closest you got was your innocent body. I mean, your innocent body didn't know what lust was. It just thought that nakedness was just something to laugh about or something. Now it's something you lust after. The closest you were to that was your body in innocence. Imagine a body of perfection, completely turned off by any and every sin out Ooh. there. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> you think that your body, when it was in innocence, enjoyed alcohol, drinking, mm -hmm. the drugs? No, it was in pain. It hated it. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41. Makes you want to go back to innocence now, right? It's just a simple question then, all right? You could have retained your innocence. What happened? You could have. There's a sermon right there. You could have maintained your innocence. What happened? You want to explore the world more like everybody else is doing? See that tree of knowledge, what that's doing? Because you're a big boy, big girl, so you don't want to be embarrassed, right? Feel like you're just so innocent or, or a virgin or something like that? See what this brainwashing wicked world did to you? That's right. Evil, man. Completely evil. It thinks that you're more intelligent when you learn how to sin. That's how disgusting and a freak this world is. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41. Yeah, amen. All right. That was my angry moment. Okay. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So your body is going to have a glow. It's going to have certain glows and lights. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 43, verse 43. It's going to have power. That's another thing to note about your body. It's going to have power. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So you will have a Superman body. But even more so, go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And Revelation 19. Joel chapter 2 and Revelation 19. So how powerful will our bodies be? Well, this is the best description the best description is Joel chapter 2. This is what movies have always tried to do with their Avengers, DC Comics, and then uh, Marvel Comics, and Pixar Animation, and uh, Anime, and all kinds of comic book heroes and shows that they try to do. You will literally see the descriptions here matching with what movies are trying to do. You will notice that. The Bible was, now this was written in Old Testament, okay? This wasn't written during uh, the 1980s or the 1960s uh, when Hollywood came out. Hollywood was too slow. They were 2,000 years off, okay? Old Testament was way ahead. Notice in Joel chapter 2 and verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. So they leave a trail of fire. That's something. Your body's got fire on it. Uh, look at verse, uh, keep reading. Verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. So you run as fast as the horses. That means you run really fast. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap. So when you jump, you can jump as high as the mountains. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. When they look at you, they're going to be in pain. They can't even stare at you. That's how powerful you'll be. You, and they get like Superman. Don't look at me, Superman. Why? Because you're going to burn me with your laser shot eyes? <laughs> In verse 6, it was way ahead of that. 
Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. No weapon on this earth is going to harm them. Amen. It's just going to be, uh, I mean, what uh, movies are trying to show you about these superheroes when these uh, villains or other people try to shoot them with guns or something, and people go, oh, wow, that's cool. It didn't, the hero didn't even flinch or phase. And <laughs> Why don't you get saved in Jesus Christ? And you poke fun at Christianity? Ain't that funny? You, you poke fun at us Christians, and you, you're the idiot watching the movie and going, whoa. <laughs> Something, right? When you look at verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. Did I read that right? Yeah. Matrix was too slow. They were way too slow. You're going to be running up on the walls like that. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. So you'll be able to sneak in, and people can't tell. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executed his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very ta terrible, and who can abide it? You'll notice right here at verse 11, this is the army of the Lord, and it happens when? The day of the Lord. Why Revelation 19 describes it for you. The day of the Lord, when he comes down and judges the world. And notice it's his army. So Joel 2 completely matches with Revelation 19, no doubt about it. Go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. Revelation 19 verse 8. So who's the army of the Lord? We're all wondering. That's you and me. That's you and me. Revelation 19, 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's you and I. The church age saints. The church. And notice we are arrayed in fine linen. Correct? Okay. Look what happens to this group in fine linen, which is us. Look at verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white ho horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the same church age saints. That's us. And we're what? The armies that followed God from heaven. Amen. And notice in verse 15, it just matches. Verse 14, 15 matches with Joel 2. There's no doubt. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He wipes out all the armies, uh, the armies of the world. And then these, this heavenly army that follows him is us. It matches Joel 2 to a T. So that's us. But the best part is Philippians 3, and 1 John 3. Philippians 3 and 1 John 3. The best body to ever have is not just this body that movies try to depict and they don't really do a perfect job like the Lord does. But the body you and I are going to have is the body of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now that's a body unlike any other body. Would you believe that? We've got the best body in all of creation. The body of God himself. Can you imagine that? That's huge. Philippians chapter 3. We'll look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? That's Jesus Christ's body at verse 20. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, Jesus Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that will solve every single problem in the world, is if you have the body of Jesus Christ. 
And then uh, write these verses down. We don't have time to turn there, but write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. And then the second one is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9 through 10. Again, the two passages are 1 Corinthians 2, 16 and 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10. These two verses point out that we're going to have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ knows everything. In fact, when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, it points out right here we only know in part. But once we see Jesus Christ, it says, then we're going to know everything. Why? Because, remember the previous verses, when we see Jesus Christ, when he appears, what happens? We have his body. Then that means we have his mind. So that's why 1 Corinthians 13 says, when, he'll, when he appears, then we're going to know everything. Because what that means is when he appears, it doesn't mean that he's going to show us everything. No, that's not what it means. What it means is when he appears, we become his body and we automatically know everything. He don't even have to show us. We're going to have the mind of Jesus Christ. That's something. All right, now let's talk about what's in heaven. What's in heaven? We're going to talk about what's in heaven. Man, it's a beautiful place, heaven. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Can't wait to go there one day. And it's in perfect fellowship. Perfect fellowship. Okay, so let's review. We talked about the origin of heaven, names of heaven, size, what heaven is like, what heaven looks like, bodies in heaven, and now we're going to talk about what's in heaven, which is perfect fellowship. Inside heaven itself, it's just perfect Fellowship. That's what you're going to find out. And the fellowship, oh my, it's something. First one, which is a no-brainer, is God. That's the best one. What better fellowship can you have than that? That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Write that down. We won't have time to turn there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Second person, Jesus. Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Third group, angels, angels. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Uh, it's so funny. You see videos nowadays where people talk about, what, Azazel or something like that, and uh, Leonardo and what Michelangelo and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle names and you know they give all these weird names to angels well hey when you go up to heaven you're going to see all those names and all those angelic beings people are so infatuated with that but when you die and go to heaven or when you get raptured you're going to meet all of them it's going to be something Old Testament saints that's another one Old Testament saints Genesis 5:24. Genesis 5, 24. The angels are Matthew 18, 10. The angels are Matthew 18, 10. The Old Testament saints are Genesis 5, 24. Jesus is Acts 3, 21. And God is Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Wow, I mean, fellowship's not going to run out. You notice that? Fellowship's not going to run out. You can talk to Moses. You can talk to Elijah. You can talk to Elisha. You can talk to Enoch. So many people you can talk to. And uh, you're already in joy by the blowout fellowship with all these other preachers and Bible believers in different churches in different areas, different nationalities, how you want to fellowship with them. You ain't seen nothing yet. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3 is another one. Matthew chapter 17, verse 3, that talks about the Old Testament saints. Another verse that talks about the Old Testament saints is 2 Kings 2.11. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Man, when you hear that song, I bowed on my knees and cried holy. I don't know if you heard that song before, but man, that's such good stuff. It talks about meeting each and every Old Testament or biblical saint, but then the last person or the first person you want to see is Jesus. The first person. 
Other one, believe it or not, a lot of people don't mention this, but supernatural creatures. Supernatural creatures. Did I say 2 Kings 2.11? Okay, thank you. Uh, write that down again, too. Another one. 2 Kings 2.11. Supernatural creatures. So you can turn over there. We're going to look at it. You know, people are so much into Pokemon, gotta catch them all, and I want to have all those animals, and oh, aren't they so cute, and aren't they so cool, and hey, you haven't, you haven't seen that drawing of a little child leading a lamb, a lion, you know, excuse me, and a leopard? Ain't that something, riding on those things? <laughs> and the creatures in heaven, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. When mankind tries to build and fantasize, it's actually a reality that we gain. And they call Christianity a fantasy. They make Pokemon more of a reality than Christianity. They take Christianity and God more as a fantasy than Pokemon. That's the day and age we live in. And if you don't believe that, go to Comic-Con at San Diego. Look at your children, what kind of games they're playing. And don't tell me that, uh, no, what you're saying is false. No, look at this. They take Pokemon more as a reality nowadays than Christianity. Would you believe it? Children will sooner believe in the reality of Santa Claus and Jesus Christ. And if you doubt me on that one, go to a bunch of liberal and atheist homes. What they're teaching their children. <laughs> you thought what I said was extreme and that I'm exaggerating? No, I'm telling you the truth and you all know it. Even the critics will admit that. 2 Kings 2, verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. How about that? Horses of fire. Go to Revelation 4, verse 7. Revelation chapter 4. Look at these weird supernatural creatures. These are something, man. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. This is one creature that has these parts of certain animals. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So this is Revelation 4, 7. Now verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Wow. Uh, people marvel when, uh, you know, some creature comes out, some special, I don't know what they call it, level 100 animal creature or in a, a trading card, and then the movie shows a special creature, oh, like that, and people, when they look at it, they're like, wow, like a bunch of idiots. Imagine a creature where you're so dazzled that the creature has a bunch of eyes all looking toward the same direction, looking at you, but then looking at the Creator, saying one noise, holy, holy, holy. That's dazzling. Amen. Now we're going to look at Isaiah 11, Isaiah chapter 11. Like I mentioned before, a little child will be able to lead a lion. Treat it like a pet, ride on it. That's something. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, and then we'll read verse 6. Verse 6, the Bible says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Now notice some of these names, the like cockatrice, and you'll notice that the bear and the cow are eating together. That is some supernatural creature of fellowship. That is some fellowship. You think that uh, a dog, you see these YouTube videos? If you don't think that's something, you're a liar. Do you see these millions of views of, of a deer and a dog playing with each other and all these people in the comments, oh, that's so cute. You notice that? Well, imagine a cow, a, cow, a deer, and a cat 
and a bear and a lion all playing together. You, oh, you're going to be dazzled by that. And don't tell me that uh, that doesn't dazzle you. No, you're a liar. I know that you're one of those people who clicked on those millions of views, okay? <laughs> don't lie to me, all right? And I guarantee every atheist that says, oh, how wonderful that is. No, it ain't that special. No, you're a liar. I, I guarantee there were millions of atheists who clicked on those animal videos. And they were, and I guarantee there are hundreds and thousands of comments from atheists saying, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's good, brother. All right, now let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Our departed loved ones. Our departed loved ones. Not just the people that we do want to see, the Old Testament saints, supernatural creatures, but people who we loved on this earth that passed away. We think that we will never see them again. You're wrong. You will see them again. Amen. Man, what perfect fellowship. Okay, you're, you're, you're amazed by the blowout, but imagine the people who died and passed away, those brothers and sisters in Christ, and they joined you at the blowout. Man. 1 Thessalonians 4.14, 4, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, that's a metaphorical expression for those who died, will God bring with him. Revelation 21, verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. No sinners or criminals or people hurting you or jerks. Basically, no jerks up there. People who annoy you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, in church, you have to put up with that. Church, you have to put up with that, and you got to love them anyway. Man, uh, we say that uh, there's no fellowship like your Bible-believing family, but let's be honest, yeah, but uh, there are still some jerks around. <laughs> but when you go to heaven, not a single one of that. Not a single awkward moment, just perfect fellowship. You, are you enjoying your fellowship now in this church? Man, imagine up in heaven. Imagine up in heaven. Absolute perfection. No one offended. Revelation 21, verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is everybody who is a criminal. Everyone who has faults and problems. They are not in heaven they are all in hell, a different place. Uh, it just gets better. There is no Satan, the biggest jerk of all, Amen. the biggest annoyance of all. No Satan. Revelation 21, verse 10. He goes to the same hell where all the annoying people are at. Revelation 20, verse, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And literally, that means forever. He's God. Revelation 22, verse 4. 22, verse 4. Yes, we see Jesus up in heaven. That's a beautiful thing. But imagine face to face. Face to face. You will see his features, what he exactly looks like. That's something, man. Revelation 22, verse 4. 22, verse 4. You know, uh, some people, they look forward to the day of the spouse or the, the person that they love, wonder what he's going to look like, wonder what she's going to look like. Their baby, the child, when he or she grows up, what's he going to look like, what she's going to look like? You're that amazed? What about Jesus Christ himself? Revelation 22, verse 4. I love this. woo -hoo -hoo. And they shall what? <laughs> I love that verse. Man, someone's got to preach a sermon on that. Robert Garcia's got to preach a sermon on that. He'll fit that one very well. You know? He's got to be shouting and you know, rev us up on that one. That's, that's such a sermon. If he won't, I will, man. I'll make a sermon on that. Such a good sermon there. Last verse, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Man, ideas are flowing so much in my head just on that one. Such a, <laughs> such a good verse. They shall see his face. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 
You know what's better than that? The half has not yet been told. Come on. Man, this is just a glimpse of it. All the songs that we sing, all the imagination and graphic arts designers, they try, they can try to draw it as best as they could. But my, the half has not yet been told. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, oh, that means scripture saith. That means it must be so. It cannot be broken. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. See, I told you, you can't even imagine it. The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. What did Jesus said? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Why is Jesus taking 2,000 years long? Because he just wants to make sure that you can't even imagine it. <laughs> the half has not been told, amen? Half has not been told. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to our hearers and fed us more with your scripture, made us more aware about what heaven looks like, what it's going to be, and that we have the verses to know and that we'll hide them in our hearts and be able to give it to other people. Perhaps if we told lost souls about heaven a bit more, then maybe they might get saved. Maybe if we were to tell them how pitiful and vain their life is compared to life in heaven, maybe they just might be attracted to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we can be so centered on hell that we don't talk about heaven. Perhaps we need to talk about that just a little bit more. Perhaps we need to think about it more. That's why we get discouraged. Our mind is too much on this earth, in this world, on our woes. We just need to think about a heaven a bit more. Maybe that's what we need today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.